I'm uh, Mark Reed, the executive director of the Transit Coalition. We're a nonprofit and we're based in Southern California. And we even have an adjunct, adjunct Transit Coalition veteran in Empire that covers Riverside and San Bernardino counties. We have a huge separate website that deals with all that. Anyway, it's just as a quick background. Transit Coalition, we do different things. We have intern programs, we have advocacy, we have educational programs like these meetings. Our next meeting in, uh, in July 19th is Arthur Leahy, of course, the head of Metro Link, and he's going to talk about the new SCORE program, which is a $10 billion rail investment, which a lot of people here could be interested in. Um, after that, we're working on the West Santa Ana branch. We're working on the San Fernando Valley uh, light rail project that got approved today. We're also going to be looking at some other things like the rail line to uh, South Bay, that's the Green Line, uh, the East Los Angeles uh, Gold Line. So there's a lot of projects, and then we'll also look at some things like construction of phase one, two, and three of the Purple Line, and if there's any other a request that would appeal to people, I'm happy to get the right person. And of course, it just finally occurred to me I could get um, Phil Washington, so we'll have him to speak sometime this year. So anyways, that's what we do at the Transit Coalition. We do educate, get information out. And the last thing I should tell you, because farmers can fill in the details, but I think one day, it was 2011, I get this call that we should have this map. And there's nobody that really conceived how you would get from the valley to West LA. So literally, overnight with Justin Walker, who's, who, who works for Air Up in San Francisco, um, but he had still was going to USC and was going off to, to Berkeley for his master's degree. We put together this map, which was actually 24 hours. I mean, Farm Mars was editing it and finding stations, and literally 10, 11 o'clock, one in the morning, we're putting this map together, and the next day we put it together, we ran copies, we went over to a, a federal meeting that Barbara Boxer was holding in West LA, and we passed out these maps. So, you know, elected offices in the back room, you see this map. It's, I don't think we brought anything tonight, but we did this map, and farmers got it all the way from Silmar to San Pedro, or to um, Long Beach, I forget. It was you know, 50 miles worth of rail that circumvented the whole county. And, you know, it was so far at that time, you know, Mike Antonovich, supervisor, would always argue why you're always building rail to downtown. And we got support from a lot of people. We actually took the, the, we took the concept, and at that point in time, San Fernando Valley was thought of as a place that hated rail. So I went out to 11 neighborhood councils. Farmers wrote this, uh, motion, and we took the motion, and I would just take it to neighbor councils, and I just went from the North San Fernando Valley, Granada Hills, Silmar, Pacoima, and went south to, en to Encino, Van Nuys, Sherman Oaks, and we got every neighbor council to pass our motion supporting rail, and then we started going into West LA, and the same thing happened. The funny thing would happen is that high speed rail would be at the same meetings. And the neighborhood councils would go absolutely crazy. And I'm thinking, I'm the next, I'm following these guys. And I come up with my proposal, and everybody liked the idea of a rail line across the San Fernando Valley. And we can see that it is one line, even though Metro had it on the ballot in 2008 as two different routes. So we were able to get support. And then one day, the Daily News calls with their annual Texas transportation story talking about how. The valley would never want rail and said, well, look, you know, here's 11 on our website. There's 11 different neighborhood councils that passed motions. I said, this is not individuals. These are neighborhood councils. It's the community that wants it. So, you know, fast forward to today. I think there was like one San Fernando Valley guy that got up at the board meeting today and said it would be a terrible trauma if we took a lane of cars away. You know, no matter that a rail, a three-car train could go 400, 800 people, it didn't matter to him. He didn't want it. Rail, but everybody else testified to the positive, and so we have gotten to the point of it would be possible to the point of reality. So 
Years and years ago, while we were doing transit advocacy, there was a line called the Crenshaw Line. And Yvonne Burke had a staff guy, Audrey Arielli, who was a bus advocate. He wanted to put electric bus circuit in the street and have electric buses on Crenshaw. And when we were doing the lobbying along the way in those days, we went to see Kevin Murray. And we were lobbying at that time for the Expo Line. And when we saw Kevin, I said, do you think the community would really want a bus rather than a train? Because he had gone on the trip to Curitiba, Brazil, and thought that the, you know, they saw these crowded buses, 80-foot buses, with uh, 300 people. It would be not tolerated. It's hard to tolerate it. an elevator that's got three extra people in it. But a transit bus going uh, six miles the length with 300 people. I mean, our bus capacity here is uh, 80 on a 60-foot bus, so you know, it's like four times as many people or some number that's crazy. So it was the same thing with when we did Crenshaw, the community understood that they deserved light rail. And so light rail came about, and I think way back in those days, I met Corey because he was working on the team that uh, was working on Crenshaw Boulevard. And so like way back when. So I've known Corey for like two decades now. So Corey's still here. I'm still here, and now, finally, of all the things, after the mayoral election of Eric Garcetti two terms ago, we brought forth about the possibility of having a rail line between the Valley and West Los Angeles. So Metro has now got to starting, well, it's, it's at the cusp right now where Metro was looking at rail between the Valley and West LA, and what are the different choices. So Corey will talk about it. There's a private industry company looking at potentially putting something up and with proposals. So now Corey is going to explain it, and the project manager, is Peter, is here too. So there's going to be lots of questions. We'll stay until you get your questions answered. But it's exciting to know that finally I survived my whole life to actually see this project come about. And it was a fairy tale many years ago. So without further ado, Corey. Thank you. So, can everyone see okay, or would you like to yeah. turn off some of the lights? We'll see if there's some lights then. A little bit better? I don't know. Yeah. This is much better. Is it? Okay. So, so, good evening. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, happy to talk to you about this project. As, as Barb mentioned, this has been a long time coming. There's been a lot of interest in this for decades, uh, figuring out a way to uh, connect the valley to the west side and, and ultimately down to LEX. So that's the project we have currently going on. Uh, we recently kicked off what we're calling a feasibility study. It's essentially an alternatives analysis study as well. Um, and that's what we kicked off in January. It's a 20 month process that we're working our way through right now. And uh, what I want to do is for tonight just really introduce the project that we have kicked off. Uh, as, as Bart mentioned, this is a, one of the measuring projects broken up into different phases. I'll describe the process we're going through. Uh, I'll walk through some initial concepts we have for the valley to west side portion only. Uh, and then uh, we are going out to the public right now to gather feedback, so tonight is one of those opportunities. Um, just as many of you know, this is the first step in our development process for Metro for how we usually develop the project. We have not started environmental, that would be the next phase um, following this feasibility study, and obviously we're shooting for transit service um, in the future. So we are studying, we are focusing our study on rail transit ideas or concepts. Uh, the study area here is on the, the right. Um, again, it goes from the valley down to LAX area. Um, right now at this stage of the process, we're really focused on looking at where, where possibly could we connect this, these lines to the existing or planning system. Um, we're also looking at uh, potential station locations to go along with those alignments. And we are also being able to get park and ride potential uh, associated with this line. Obviously, maintenance is going to be a, a crucial part of this. Uh, if it's a separate line as opposed to something that's an extension or connection to an existing line, um, it needs its own maintenance facility. We're, we're going to begin to look at the requirements for that, but I'm not going to talk about any locations tonight. Uh, and then lastly, we, we have divided this, this, section, this study area into two sections. So the first section that I'll go over tonight is the Valley to West Side portion. And then at future meetings, as we get further along, we'll look at uh, extending some of these ideas further south to connect LAX. 
So at the beginning of the process, we, we develop a purpose and need statement for why we're doing the project. Essentially, we're looking at a high quality transit service that's going to connect from the valley to the west side of LEX. Um, we want it to be a competitive travel option. I think what's unique about this corridor is that given the severe traffic congestion we have in the 405, transit could be a really competitive option, uh, especially if it's direct, if it's high speed and connecting really um, dense areas of our county, both in terms of uh, employment or in housing. Um, to do that though, we're looking at again, speed, frequency of the service, the capacity of the different options we're studying, um, and the reliability of the service. What's out there today is just not reliable. It's buses you know, dealing with the same congestion through the past as all the other people in their automobile. So it it's, doesn't take much to improve on what's there today. Um, and all the while, we're looking at community connections to existing or planned uh, transit lines in the area. So we have a seven step process for us. We've completed steps one and two. Uh, one was just researching the study area, looking at some different transit technologies that we could use. Uh, and also developing some initial concepts for the Valley to West Side. That we just completed around public meetings uh, earlier this month, so where we introduced a lot of these ideas. And then going forward, we'll begin to uh, look at the Valley to West Side options in more detail. The idea is that we want to take some of them off the table, and what's, what remains or what will become uh, extensions uh, or West Side LAX options. And then we're going to have another round of meetings in the fall where we'll bring back some of that information. After that, we'll begin to narrow down the west side LAX options and ultimately uh, come back next spring with a full end-to-end -end concepts for people to look at uh, and then begin to package everything into a final report that we would deliver to the Metro Board in the fall of next year. So I'll go through the uh, initial concepts now. I wanted to quickly get through some of the, the previous stuff. Um, this is a, an abridged presentation from what we gave to the public, so all of this information is available online where we talk a little bit more about um, uh, travel markets, we looked at different travel markets in the area and how, um, where people are coming from and going to. So that information is online. We also have some information it's boards. It's uh, metro.net and uh, just look up some poll of the transit corridor. Okay. Yep. I think most of you understand some of the terminology that we use for the transit uh, com concept, so I won't get into this, but we use this to give folks an idea of what we're about to talk about. But I'll jump right into the modes, first of all. So we looked at a number of modes initially, and we narrowed them down to four that we were recommending go forward into the concepts that were developed and, and sh that I'm showing tonight. The four here are uh, two on the left, they're heavy rail and light rail, which we operate today in the metro system. We're all familiar with that. Uh, two, uh, one thing I'll point out about those two uh, technologies, though, we are looking at slightly longer trains than what we operate today in the metro system. So up to eight cars and heavy rail, I mean, far it goes up to 10, so we could even be longer than that. Uh, light rail, we're looking at three or four. Our board recently said, hey, why not six? So, you know, th there's some flexibility in how far you go, uh, depending on if you're fully grade separated or not. So that's uh, kind of a new piece that we're considering for those two modes. Uh, on the right, we have monorail and rubber tire, which are not today operated in Los Angeles, but. Uh, we're looking at those primarily for their ability to possibly go up and over the Sepulveda Pass as opposed to through it. So these two uh, offer the uh, ability to go up those steeper grades. So this is a summary of the six concepts that we've developed so far uh, for the study. Um, they're not in priority order. They're just uh, numbered so we can refer to them. Um, but two heavy rail options, two light rail, a monorail or rubber tire concept, and then lastly an extension of the, of the purple line that were planned for the West side area. So I'll go through each of these uh, quickly if I can, and then we can have questions at the end. Uh, the first concept is a heavy rail transit concept. Uh, the map in the middle shows the entire alignment from the valley of the west side. The solid line means that the entire alignment is underground in the tunnel. And uh, this particular corridor lines up with the Van Nuys Boulevard corridor in the valley with uh, a connection, as you see on the left there, at the Van Nuys Metro Orange Line station. Okay. So this is heavy rail, the orange line is bus rapid transit, and then the dashed uh, light blue line you see there is the East San Fernando Valley project that, that uh, Barr just mentioned. That has been approved as of today as a light rail transit line for the valley. So there's three different modes that are coming together there. So this option would mean that you would have to transfer to either the orange line or the East San Fernando Valley line in order to continue your uh, trip to other points of the valley. As you move uh, through the mountain pass, uh, again, it's in a tunnel, so it's a fairly straight line from the valley, Van Nuys corridor, down to the west side area. 
When it gets to the west side, there are a couple options for connecting to the purple line. The first is on the west side of the 405 at the Westwood UCLA sta or VA station, Veterans Administration there. Um, the other option is at Westwood UCLA station. Both of those are planned as part of the Purple Line Extension 3 project. Is that the Westwood Boulevard, Wilshire Westwood Boulevard? Uh, yeah, the Westwood UCLA is, is at Wilshire right. and Westwood. Westwood. Yeah. yeah. And so those are the two options for connecting to the Purple Line. Um, from there, uh, from the VA, you could extend south to connect to the Expo at, at Bundy. Uh, and then from Westwood UCLA, you could either go to Bundy or to uh, Expo Sepulveda. Bundy and Sepulveda are both aerial stations, aerial light rail stations. So this alignment would again be in a tunnel underneath that, and you would transfer two levels up to get to the, uh, the light rail system. Now, this configuration of options on the west side is the same for concepts one to four, so I won't repeat this for the next few, but just remember that basically all the connections to either the purple line or the expo line remain the same. Okay, so concept two is another heavy rail uh, option. This one, though, as it goes to the Santa Monica Mountains, it lines up more with Sepulveda Boulevard, uh, closer to the 405. Uh, following, uh, coming out of the mountains, it, it could follow Sepulveda uh, up to the orange line. The dash line in this uh, situation means that we're looking at underground or aerial. So um, it would be the first time that we're bringing our subway above ground in this case. Uh, but we're looking at it through the valley, um, roughly from Ventura up to the Orange Line, and at which point people would transfer to the Orange Line at that point. Uh, and from there, uh, we would want, we're looking at two options to connect to the East San Fernando Valley corridor. One would be to continue north on Sepulveda and east at Victory, to connect over at Victory and Van Nuys on the East San Fernando Valley line. The second option would be go to the North Sherman Way and East Van Nuys Boulevard and, and transfer there. So two, one of those options would be the choice for alignments to get over to the East San Fernando Valley project or line. The third concept is the first light rail concept. So um, this is essentially the same as I showed you in one. So again, it's a, it's a tunnel for the entire length from the west side through the mountains to um, the Van Nuys corridor. Here we continue on under Van Nuys uh, and then connect at the orange line. In this case, since it is light rail and we now know that East San Fernando Valley is light rail, this could actually connect in or interline with the East San Fernando Valley line and essentially be uh, a single line that operates from Silmar San Fernando Valley Station, which is the northernmost station on that line, all the way down to Expo that we see here. Okay. Um, so uh, that's, that's the first light rail option. Uh, the second one is a slightly different option, the same general alignment, it's following Van Nuys Boulevard. But in this case, we um, have a branch that comes off of the alignment on Van Nuys. And it goes west to connect to the Sepulveda station of the Orange Line, um, where we have an existing park and ride facility. A uh, very large, large piece of property that Metro currently owns, and could possibly be another parking lot opportunity area as well. Um, in this case, we would have essentially two lines operating. So the East San Fernando Valley line that I mentioned before, which would be from Silmar all the way down to Expo, and then a second line, which would be from the Sepulveda Orange Line station, would come into the same corridor and continue down to Expo. So the two combined would be very frequent service, essentially through the through the Santa Monica Mountains. Concept five is the, the monorail or rubber tire concept. Uh, this one is, is uh, quite a bit different in terms of when it goes to the Santa Monica Mountains. So you'll see the alignment actually swings west and, and generally follows the 405 freeway. So we're looking at an alignment that would be in the 405 right away corridor, um, not necessarily in the median of the freeway, but most likely to either side of the freeway. Uh, and it would follow that alignment from roughly Getty Center Drive on the south side, north through the mountains, um, until approximately Ventura Boulevard. At which point we're looking at, um, well, the dashed line in the mountains means that it could either be aerial or at grade. We're looking at possibilities of both through there. But then once you're in the valley, the, the line type there means that we're looking at primarily aerial for this particular mode or modes. So in the valley, uh, it lines up with the Sepulveda Boulevard corridor, 
and then we're looking at three possible ways to connect to the Orange Line and the East San Fernando Valley Line. The first option would be to follow Sepulveda and then go east on Burbank, north on Van Nuys, to connect at the Van Nuys Orange Line station. Again, that would be a transfer from here to either the Orange Line or the East San Fernando Valley Line. The other uh, options would be to continue north on Sepulveda, transfer at the Orange Line at the Sepulveda station, and then either go along Big Tree or Sherman Way to connect to the East San Fernando Valley Line at the Hatch Boulevard. On the west side, it's, it, it's really the same in terms of the possible connection points to the Purple or, or to the Expo Line. The only difference is we're coming off of the 405, so the alignment that needs to get to Westwood UCLA is, is a little bit more movement to the east and then coming south to, to connect in there at the Westwood and Wilshire, essentially. Uh, and there are the same options down at Expo for this. Again, um, the solid line here means that these options are being considered for underground. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where you typically see monorail above ground, and here we're putting in a tunnel, so it's all these kind of issues of right-of-way constraints and, and the fact of, you know, passing out of the mountains through a major university campus, etc., cetera, and, and all of that. So it's putting some of these modes in some unique configurations, let's say. Now, concept six, the last one. Um, this is essentially an extension or extensions of the Purple Line project. So uh, the Purple Line currently is planned to go all the way out just west of the 405 with the two stations that I talked about earlier. And then the first extension north would go through the Santa Monica Mountains in a tunnel, and then there would be two alignment options. The one on the right would be lining up with the Van Nuys Boulevard corridor, uh, and then continue north to uh, terminate at the Van Nuys Orange Line station, where you transfer to Orange Line or East San Fernando Valley. The other option is to stay more west near the 405 and connect with the Sepulveda Boulevard corridor. Again, we're looking at the dashed line, meaning aerial underground in that case. Uh, and the same options as you saw earlier, where you'd continue north to the Orange Line at, at Sepulveda Station with the transfer, or uh, north and east along Big Tree or Sherman Way to connect to East San Fernando Valley corridor. Okay. On the south, um, it's another extension, but this time southward, uh, to connect down to the Expo Line at Bundy. And so this essentially has then two extensions, one going north and one going south. And in this section here, it's all tunnel. Uh, again, to meet the Expo Bundy station, which is an aerial light rail station. So those are the six concepts. Uh, in terms of station areas that we're looking at, um, we show them here for the valley and for the west side. And on the valley, you'll, you'll see that they're mostly along the Van Nuys Boulevard or the Sepulveda Boulevard, the alignments that we just talked through. And the, the squares represent stations that could be either underground or aerial, and the circles are underground only. Okay? And then the stations that we're looking at possible park and ride facilities connected with are shown with the letter P there on each of those squares or circles. So starting at the bottom, we're looking at Ventura Boulevard, a couple stations along Magnolia, east-west, Burbank east-west, obviously the Orange Line, and again, Victory and Sherman Way for um, station options. On the west side, all the alignments, again, were underground, so all the stations would be underground, the circles there. Um, we obviously have, we were looking at one uh, on the campus at UCLA, which is shown there at the top. Uh, again, the two options in the purple line. Looking at the Santa Monica Boulevard corridor south of that, um, we're also looking at Olympic and then ultimately connecting into Expo at the two stations I mentioned. More south, we're looking at Barrington, Sawtell, uh, Sepulveda, Westwood. Those are the major north-south streets that we're looking at, uh, connecting to some of these station locations. So we're, we developed a set of criteria that we're taking out to the public, getting some feedback on, but a lot of these comments to many of Metro's projects were developing ridership forecasts, um, the travel time savings, we'll eventually get to cost once we have a little bit more detail on the projects. Um, and then obviously community input and some initial thoughts on environmental concerns uh, will be things that we look at as we move through the evaluation. We are still early on the, on the process. We're in the introduction phase now. It's 20 months. We look to be done with this study by the end of uh, fall next year. Um, as I said, the, the idea is that at the end of the study completion, we want to package a um, small set of alternatives, smaller than what we have on the table today, 
and we recommend those to the Metro Board to advance those into the environmental review process. And we hope to start that process at the end of 2019 or the beginning of 2020. Um, so trying to move ahead quickly, uh, the project has an opening date in Measure M that is 2033 for the project that extends from the valley to the west side, and then 2057 for the project that extends from the west side to LEX. Okay, so there's two phases to this project many decades out, um, but as part of this initial study we're looking at the whole corridor, and then what may advance in the environmental may be a smaller um, sec section of that. Okay. We are currently out in the community, as I mentioned, we have a lot of different ways to um, provide feedback. Um, we had a really good initial response to the project, nearly 7,000 folks are interested right off the bat, which was pretty amazing. Um, we put a survey out, uh, which has over 5,500 responses now, I think, which was a record, I think, for Metro in terms of you know, a survey, especially being out for a very short amount of time. So we've had a lot of really, really good feedback from folks. We're working with other different groups, such as community services agencies or, or groups within the county. Um, we produce a project video, which is on our website. Um, all the information that I'm talking about tonight is also on the website. You can take the survey there if you haven't already. We recommend you do that. Uh, it'll be up for a little while longer. Uh, and then we're doing a lot of social media stuff, such as Facebook and, and Twitter and, and other ways to um, reach out to folks. Um, with that, I'll stop and uh, turn it over to questions. Yes. On concepts one to four, there's yeah. a branch that goes into West LA. Is it either or, or are both of them going to be in play? Yeah, let me go back to these so we can look at them. So you one, go, you get to choose which one, or is there going to yeah, be one picked? It one one would be picked. So the the branch coming out of the mountains, the either to the Westwood VA or to the Westwood UCLA. Yeah, it's not a not a both. So it's the Paul, but um, in Bundy, either. It's either. Yeah, it's not both. Have you developed your evaluation criteria yet, and will the community give input into that? Yes, um, I had a slide on that a few seconds ago. Um, yeah, it's okay. And we, we took that out to the community, um, and we're we're still open to comments on that. Um, again, like I said, a lot of that is very common to a lot of the other projects we do, but um, we've already received quite a bit of comments um, on, on a number of different topics, whether it be specific alignments, where they want their stations, where they want um, park and ride, uh, environmental concerns, um, you know, air, visual, noise, we're, we're hearing some of those stuff already, some of those things already. Um, so yeah, we'll have it out there and we'll open to feedback from the community. Uh, sorry if you mentioned this. Uh, is this project on the, the Valley to West Side portion? Is that on the 28 by 28 list? It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. and that particular segment is. So, this portion from the Valley to West Side is identified in one of the initiatives here at Metro called the 28 by 2028 initiative, which is looking at advancing 28 projects for the county with the intent of having them open and operating for the 2028 Olympics and Paralympic Games. So um, this is one of those. Um, this is a heavy lift, obviously. Um, you know, we in, in the initiative itself, it, it talks about aspirational projects, and this is obviously, obviously a big one that, that requires a lot of help to get there for 28. Yeah. Um, I, how much is a private sponsorship, a private public sponsorship, considered to expedite the 2028 date? It, it's being considered heavily. So uh, Metro. We have a new department at Metro, it's been around for over a year, I guess, but it's uh, Office of Extraordinary Innovation, and they're leading up the public-private partnership, um, you know, exploration, let's say. Um, and there are several projects already in, in Metro's portfolio that have been identified for possibly going P3. Um, this is one of them. And um, we also have a program called an Unsolicited Proposal Program where we, people can just send in their, companies can send in their ideas. Um, and we received a few of those on this project itself. So um, yeah, this is being one, this is one that's being considered for P3. Uh, West Santa Ana Branch is another one I think that, that Bart mentioned, that's another P3 as well. So um, yeah, looking at all possible ways to accelerate these projects. Does, 
Do you guys are trapped? Do you know the elevation difference? Higher in the valley than down in Westwood, but then the depth of the tunnel because of the mountains would be up to 700 feet below the peak if it's a straight. If you try and go right. in a straight the tunnel, so you would start angle up, level right. out, but the mountain. The grade is how high? It's slow. It's like one percent or something because you've got six miles to make up that difference. It's minimal. The grade in the tunnel. The grade in the tunnel. Up, the up and over. Oh, up and over. It's um, it's steeper on the valley side. On the front right. side, it's three to four percent. On the back side, it's uh, up to six and seven percent on the going down into the valley. Uh, it's the Transit Coalition's Facebook page called Valley to West Side Rail. Um, Justin Walker, who's an engineer for um, Era, actually did the elevations. It's a nine tenths of a percent grade. If you do a tunnel, and it was like 16 or 1800 feet at one time, his boss Dave and Meager estimated if you did light rail from the valley floor at you know, three or four percent grade, you'd be up to 180 feet up in the air. Um, with 1200 people on a light rail train in earthquake country, I don't know that that would be that popular. But um, there is a map and it shows the elevations and the numbers, and it's just Facebook Valley to West LA. Rail or the Transit Coalition page. If you punch around, you can find it. But there is a map that actually shows that exact question. Thank you. Yes. Could you please elaborate a little bit on the expected uh, rider and uh, the target capacity for the different body proposed? That's a good question. So we're we're just getting into the ridership forecast for this project. Um, Obviously, there, there's a big difference between the light rail technology in terms of capacity and, and the heavy rail. Um, and we're also looking at three cars or four cars on light rail versus six or eight or ten on heavy rail. So there's, there's differences there. Um, and the other thing is that by connecting it to the East San Fernando Valley corridor, that project is defined, obviously, as a three-car system that would be from Silmar down to this location. So it's a matter of coordinating how you might connect the Sepulveda piece into that, um, given that that entire infrastructure is set up for the three-car trains, and how that would work with what we may want to put through the mountains uh, as part of this project. So um, we're going to look at all that uh, in terms of the ridership potential under different scenarios. Our model is unconstrained, so it's not taking in you know the capacity limitations of the mode, and the model is just showing the demand. So. There is the potential that demand exceeds the capacity of, of these types of technologies. If we constrain them to three-car trains at five-minute headways, you know, 12 cars peak direction per hour, those are things that we'll have to um, we'll have to consider and, and, and take a look at. Um, so those might be eliminated based on that as you go the, the, Yeah, there's the potential. I mean, you know, we, we, it depends on the demand. There, there's obviously this uh, huge expectation, and you know, I, I would be lying if I said I'm not one of them that would say that. There, there could be quite a bit of demand through this corridor. Uh, and does that demand line up very well with light rail as we've typically done it in Los Angeles? And the answer may be no. Yeah. Um, but then again, the question is, how does it line up to heavy rails we've t typically done it, right? And then what I would, would say is the third question is, is how does all of this demand line up with what we're planning in the network today, right? So we have this potential mega line that wants to move a lot of people between the valley and the west side, what effect does that have on the intersecting lines, right? We have a BRT system going through the valley with a transfer connection. We have a light rail system in the valley with possibly light, a transfer connection. And then we have purple and expo on the south side with similar conditions. And obviously at expo, we have a terminus condition, right, where you are forced to transfer. So those are things we'll have to look at as well in terms of what, are, what changes that may there be on the on the other lines um, with the introduction of this project. Yeah. Well, I think you know that the, the real question at hand with uh, the questions you just laid out is have we historically planned our rail lines correctly to anticipate future demand, and I would posit that the answer is no. Um, no, we have not planned the light rail system uh, uh, systems very well. The Expo line, the 
platforms are way too short to accommodate extra cars, and uh, that that train is you know, open to crush loads. It's you know peak hour is still a crush loads. Um, uh, the blue line is an all that great system, except for a few stops downtown, and it is slower than the last two January. Um, um, the Van Nuys system that just got approved today, we're talking three, four flat, three, four car platforms at grade, and all the neighbor councils up and down Van Nuys Boulevard said, no, 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 we need grade separated six car platforms. So um, I think that, that with this project uh, represents is not an opportunity to test old disproven theories again and keep disproven, <laughs> but to come up with a new, better paradigm for how do you actually do light rail or heavy rail in the, system, in the city. And the, the, the heavy rail we do is also under plan. The, the red car platforms are six cars, the, light, the heavy rail trains can do ten cars. We should have built them longer to begin with. So we got we got to think bigger and bolder, especially with the most congested route in the country that we're trying to create by an alternative to. Yeah. Uh, can I, can I um, make a comment? Sure. Los Angeles has been, and has, was never master planned, ever, yep. from the beginning. So we've been trying to catch up with that since Los Angeles inception. Um, the faster we build freeways, the faster we build um, trains, it, it doesn't seem like we're ever going to catch up because more people move into Los Angeles than move out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Thanks for the um, Is there still a plan to build, uh, put express lanes on the 405 and would that impact you know, selection of one of these alternatives? Yes. Well, I don't know if I had the selection, but I'll say it. Um, when I mentioned earlier that we're looking not so much at the median of the 405 for the, the one concept five here, but more either side of the 405, it's it's with that, that thinking in mind that there is uh, a project plan, express lanes project plan from the 101 to the 10 along the 405 and the median. Uh, it's actually the first phase, technically, of the Sepulveda Transit Corridor project that's identified in Metro M. Uh, so the express lanes would be first, opening in 26, and then the two transit components that I mentioned, 33 and 57, would be open after that. So, yeah, we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at some ideas for the, the Sepulveda Pass is, you know, how do we allow things to fit within a constrained, you know, area. What speeds and what headways are you looking at right now for the cars? We're looking at um, on the uh, heavy rail and light rail. The light rail we're looking at five minutes in the peak, headways, ten minutes in the off peak. Um, that's what we model. Uh, and then for the speeds on the light rail? The speeds we're looking at up to 65 miles per hour. Yeah. Um, the heavy rail up to 75 miles per hour. Uh, we model slightly below that just to be conservative in terms of and then travel time. Uh, and then on the subway, we're looking what, at what headways we're looking at? For the subway, we're looking at four minutes, 10 minutes for the subway, which is consistent with what we have planned out there today. And what about on the rubber tire and the monogram? Rubber tire, we're, we're probably going to take it down to the four minutes also, the four minutes and the 10 minutes, um, and, and see how that how that fares. And what speeds can they get up to? Uh, typically up to 50 miles per hour, top speed. Um, obviously traversing the mountains through the 405 corridor, you might go a little slower obviously with the grades and the, and the curves, but uh, in the flat sections you should be able to get up to 50 miles per hour at least with the technology that's out there today. Does the monorail slow down by grade also? I'm sorry? Is the monorail substantially slowed down by grade also? Um, more passenger comfort than the way the alignment works in terms of the curves. But they thought about doing partial tunnel? Start we, we have it in partial tunnel. You'll see here this section um, just south of Getty roughly is all in, all in a tunnel. So that, that section speeds could be higher once you're in the tunnel. Um, maybe on average slower through the, um, through the mountain pass area. And it should be higher in the valley when you're on an elevated structure. I'm sure you've already looked at it, but uh, that far underground, what's the uh, likelihood of uh, how much did you study earthquakes in that area? 
Well, we've looked at the fault lines um, that are in the area. There's the Santa Monica fault line, obviously, on the south side, which we've been uh, well aware of with the purple line extension. Uh, there's the Benedict Canyon fault, which is in the past that we've looked at. But, um, and then obviously there's, there's some uh, seismic activity everywhere in Southern California. But, uh, you know, tunnels, we've designed them for quite a while. We have requirements that we meet for seismic, same with aerial structures. If we train Oh, in the terms of length, in yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, in the tunnel, yeah, given the depth, the given the depth, and Laura, correct me if I'm wrong. Given the depth that we have with these tunnels, we're not obviously looking for a, a escape shafts or stairways going 600 feet to the mountain top. <laughs> so, would there be other means, you know, escape trains or something, moving people out of one tunnel into another tunnel that's not having an issue, and, and being able to move them, move them horizontally <laughs> that way? Um, because you're looking at a six mile, up to six mile long tunnel um, that's very, very deep. So um, things like vent shafts or, you know, escape shafts are a little bit more challenging in that depth. Or having fire in the tunnel. Or having fire in the tunnel, yeah. right. Yes. Is there all twin bore configuration? I'm sorry? It's all twin bore. Uh, yeah, we're looking at twin bore, single bore. We're looking at the advantages, disadvantages of, of both. Um, in these different conditions, you know, I mean, the valley is its own animal. The mountain obviously presents its challenge, and then in the west side, uh, density also presents a challenge in terms of getting our stations in there. So we're looking at both right now. Obviously, a single bore would be new to Metro, so that's something we'll have to uh, sensitize slowly throughout our agency. Yeah. So um, for Cost of Five, are you looking at a uh, potential Getty Center station, or is that something that you know? Uh, I would say it's not possible. Um, we haven't proposed it right now. I mean, the Getty Center is not quite the, the trip attractor that you would see at other station locations. Um, you also have to keep in mind that with the station, you're going to slow the, the overall trip down quite a bit. So we're not proposing it right now. We've actually not heard a lot of feedback yet on that as far as uh, recommending stations at either the Getty or the Scoreball. Um, there's been some, though. So there is a little bit of interest out there. but. Uh, we still may look at it from a ridership perspective, just to say if we were to add a station, really what, what kind of gain in ridership do we see with that? Because it's somewhat uh, counterintuitive when you say adding a station may actually reduce ridership, right? Because people say if you add a station, more people are going to get on. But if you're making it slower, then maybe fewer people are going to get on. So that's something that we may look at just to have that point of comparison for folks. Yes? Um, I'm wondering about the tunnels and commitment to a certain kind of engineering. Because for example, the Orange Line, there's currently discussion of potentially upgrading it from bus rapid transit to light rail. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if uh, a decision, for example, is made to go for a light rail through a tunnel. Is that set in stone, so to speak? Or could you upgrade to heavy, design it so that it could be upgraded to heavy rail in the future if that was thought to be an advantage? Oh, that's a good question. Um, could you convert it to heavy rail if you wanted to? Um, that's a good, I, I don't have an answer today. I'm, the I'm, infrastructure I'm, has to be completely redone as yeah, far as, you know, because the you heavy rail you're using the third, the third rail and then the overhead. And you're the, using overhead for light rail, so yeah. the infrastructure is quite different. Right, I mean, where we have our power and everything else is so, so very, very different. So you're talking about a, a, a big expense for converting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those things where you try to do it right the first time or pay the, pay the price the second time, so. Um, are the tunnel diameters the same? Yeah. The tunnel? Yeah, yeah. 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 the twin bore, they're. No, no, for, for light rail versus heavy yeah. rail. Yeah, yeah. 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 they're the same diameter. The, the, tun the tunnel at Crenshaw is the same as the tunnel up for the purple line? The vehicles are wider. But the red line vehicles are wider, so the clearance envelope is larger, so the tunnel itself is larger, and the walkways are different. So you could design it for theoretical conversion, but you'd have to make the bigger tunnel. And then if you're going to make the bigger tunnel, then the only difference is the vehicle. So you might as well go in you know, to the larger vehicle. Yeah, I mean, if the cost is really in the tunnel itself, and the, the, the actual cost of the vehicle is not really a deciding factor, then you might, as Laura was saying, just make the investment in the larger vehicle. 
Would the estimated ridership have a great deal to do with selection of light rail versus heavy rail? In other words, how much more than the red line do you think is going to be the capacity that's going to ride this? How comparable is it going to be to the amount of people that take the red line? Larger or smaller? And it's it's larger. probably going to be larger. Um, the, you know, the difference between, as I mentioned before, the model doesn't differentiate the vehicle type, right? So it doesn't say that this train type can only carry this many people, therefore the ridership is depressed to associate with that capacity limits, right? So it just is demand. So the things that we look at in the model are how many times people have to transfer. So if, if a light rail option has fewer transfers, that's, that's attractive in, in the model and, and more people may be inclined to, to take it. Um, so that's, that's maybe the biggest difference between light rail and heavy rail is that light rail has an option of connecting in with another, another planned line. And, and potentially fewer transfers. Yeah. Where's the last <coughs> station? Be I can't see that before it takes off through the tunnel, through the pass. Uh, it, yeah, to be determined. But it's the either the purple line, uh, either the. No, I'm saying from the valley. Where's the last? Oh, the valley it would be along Ventura Boulevard. Near where? Uh, Van Nuys or Sepulveda. So was, I've been thinking for years. Why doesn't the city? Next to the Galleria, on the south side of the Galleria, yeah. north side of the Galleria. Uh, yeah. South side. There's well, I mean, just no, general. On the north area. side of the Galleria, you have a huge, massive lot. I don't know what, who owns it or what it's. Oh, on the north, north side, side of the Galleria. There, mm -hmm. as yeah. you go towards the 101. Right. And then you have the miniature ball place, and then you have the fire. There's so much land going down that they right. can put a huge station, parking, and everything there. Right. Yeah, we have the river and the, the 101. There's, there's a lot of development. For that intersection, it's heavily opposed by neighborhood organizations. Uh, a lot of these neighborhood organizations, especially the Encino Homeowners Association, the Cerno Homeowners Association, and the Neighborhood Council, the Rose Neighbor Council, are in theory uh, uh, supportive of the rail concept, condition uh, with the condition that it be nowhere at the near Sepulveda Boulevard and Ventura Boulevard mm -hmm. at all. They so do not want it in their backyard. So they now, They'd rather have to go to Vienna. Two thousand units of apartments and retail. They don't want. They don't want. They don't want the apartments and retail at all. Well, Something's going to go up there. <laughs> yeah. I, I heard the big lot you're talking about is going to be an apartment complex. It's been sold already, so it's no longer available for bid. Yeah, eminent domain. I mean, that's the perfect space for a station. But, but they don't. You can come from the, all different directions, and this is just a thought of mine. The majority of the people that are going to use this are the people that work in Westwood and Century City. Mm -hmm. And they're all living in Encino and Sherman Oaks and Tarzan area. Well, so one, thing that, one thing that we did, you know, when we looked at the park and ride areas, obviously one thing to consider is how accessible are they from the, the freeways that, that right. we may be attracting people off of. So you have the 405 freeway, obviously north-south, and then the 101 east-west. As we move further east towards Van Nuys, we're getting further away from the 405, so we have to ask ourselves, is that still going to be attractive to people who are coming eastbound on the 101, or even those who are on the 405, how far will they be willing to leave the freeway in order to, to access a park and ride facility? So those are, those are questions, right? So we just put them out as some possibilities, and we'll continue to evolve them as we go. And the reason I'm saying that is I've done my own studies. That's why I'm here trying to figure out stuff. And then you've got UCLA, right? Yeah. So I just thought. <laughs> yeah. Maria, I just want to say, I'm really impressed with how you all have launched the feasibility study and especially the public outreach component. As a, a veteran of a number of different metro projects, um, I, I mean, this is really mind-blowing just how comprehensive of an approach you all are taking uh, right from the get-go. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, one of the questions that seems to be a recurring theme that I'm hearing here tonight is, how are you going to evaluate uh, the ridership and modeling? And uh, one aspect of that in particular that's of interest to me is how are you looking at the challenge of modeling induced demand? Because we know that there are many trips that are not being currently made from the valley to the west side, that if you had a shorter travel time than driving on the 405, which mm -hmm. this might make possible during rush hour, mm -hmm. um, that you know those trips might be made. Right. So 
out of curiosity, I know this is very early into the feasibility study, but what, what thoughts do you have so far in terms of modeling induced demand? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think, I don't know that, I'd say historically our modeling has been somewhat conservative in terms of what we expect to see even in future years. And, you know, part of this is art, not just all science. So induced demand is a tricky one. You know, I think there's a lot of different variables you have to take into consideration. Everyone's different. Um, every situation is different. Every trip is different, right? So it's really hard to somehow bring that all together and, and give us a, a number on how many people will actually um, come out from what they do today and, and, and take this. I think what we are looking at is, I think the point I made earlier, this corridor is, is one of the easiest corridors, if you think about it, to, to really really beat what you can do out there in an automobile. I mean, it, it doesn't take much convincing of anyone to say, if we put a rail through here and we can go from Ventura to the Purple Line in six minutes, <laughs> is that better than what you can do on a car? Yes. Right? I mean, well, that's that, not even a question, I think, yeah, once you start putting that kind of um, you travel often out them. there, that, that, that level of comp competitiveness, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's unknown how many people are going to all of a sudden change their behavior and decide to, to give this a try. Um, and that help, what would the competitive pricing be between the express lanes on the 405 and taking uh, a trip on this, uh, on, the, on the transit? Well, yeah, I mean, the transit, we're, we're, right now we're assuming the current fare policy, so you're looking at $1.75 or $2 in the future. Uh, versus whatever the rates are for the express lanes <coughs> during these periods. Could be thirty could be thirty yeah. thirty five dollars. Could be. Yeah, so the pricing is is not as well. Yes. Huge. So the, the green line and the blue line, everybody was said everybody said that nobody was gonna use it and now it's um, <laughs> very successful. It's you need another <laughs> option. <laughs> you need yeah. it yeah. Another it's size. A, everybody's taking it. So yeah. Um, I think it would be really hard to determine or look into the you know, crystal ball to know who's going to use it and who's not. Um, also, you know, I just want to mention that um, with these millennials, I mean, they're anti-car, you know, and they're right. Uber and Lyft. Right. And so um, I'm not really sure if, if that is even considered into your plan that they're used to using Uber and Lyft and right. any other you know, types of um, transportation other than, you know, buying a car and paying for an insurance. I mean, they're, we're, you know, it's, it's a different generation, right. you know? And I don't, I don't mean to be argumentative, but that was old thought. Statistics are showing that millennials are just the same when it comes to purchasing cars right now. Okay. Believe well, it or not. I stand in the U.S. or in L.A.? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious. The study I, I did, uh, I read, uh, did major, all, the, all the major metro areas and in, what year in was the that? U.S. It just, it just took place uh, this year. Oh. Matter of fact, it was published about three or four months ago. Okay. Does the project right. require mm -hmm. federal mm -hmm. funding? And if so, what percentage yeah. did you assume moving up this summer? I... That's, uh, that's a good question. I don't know what our current assumption is. We, we do expect to go after better funding for the project. I mean, given its scales and hacking of the budget. The truck um, shouldn't be there by then. I'm sorry? The truck shouldn't be there by then. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right now it's not too attractive, but it could be. It will affect the timeline of trying to get it done. Yeah. 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 Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's true, yeah. It's, things will have to yeah. take into consideration. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is it true? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if there is a station at UCLA, something we're very supportive of at UCLA, obviously, um, would, uh, would, is it assumed that the connection with the Purple Line would be at Wilshire West Westwood, or would it, was there a chance that it's going to be off of the VA? No, it would be at Westwood, UCLA, or Wilshire Westwood. Okay. Yeah, just that, you know, at UCLA, we have the, the cemetery that's, you know, oh, just, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of standing in the way of... <laughs> The campus and the um, VA facility, so that that's something that we want to yeah stay away from. Question uh, on three and four. Obviously, um, 
the benefits of those two is uh, Silmar to West Side as a one seat ride on the light rail. But the one thing that you probably didn't mention is does that take into consideration if the Orange Line is converted to rail in 2050s that there's a Chatsworth to West Side one seat ride on light rail? Yeah, that's a. 50, the 60s is, is the more accurate timeline for the conversion of the orange line. So but that looks more like it's just one mile of it already converted, or at least running parallel with the bus route. Yeah, I mean, I, there is the, the possibility that the, the branch that we're showing here could interline eventually with the orange line service that is converted to light rail, right? So in, in, it's not impossible that you could have something going from Jansworth and then also traveling through this public corridor. It's a very good point. It's more so with this option than it would be with three, because three is is essentially underneath the um, orange line, and there'd have to be a, a separate connection built that would tie into that orange line system. Yep. On the past project experience, what, what, what option do you foresee? Uh, which option will you foresee to face the least environmental scrutiny? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's, if you look at the light rail and the heavy rail, there's not that much difference in a lot of the alignment that we're looking at, um, other than distance, but a lot of it is tunnel through, through the mountains, tunnel on the west side, and then the main difference on the north side is, is aerial versus tunnel. Um, the, the one thing I will say is we did look at you know, some <coughs> other areas, like looking west of the 405 at the, um, what is it, Woodman Station or Woodley Station on um, the Orange Line? Woodman. Woodman, yeah, thank you. Woodley. Woodley? To the west? Oh, yeah, Woodley. yeah, Woodley's to the east, right? Woodley's to the west. Woodley's okay, Woodley's to the west. It's Woodley's west to the, the right. It's west of the All right, got it. Sorry, thank you. Uh, anyway, we had the Sepulveda Basin, which was an area that would have been very challenging from an environmental standpoint to go through, under, over. Um, so we backed out of that concept. Um, but I say right now that there's no, nothing really jumping out as being exceptional versus the other in terms of the environmental issues that are going to come out against it. Except for all the rich people. Uh, I, what, sorry? Except for all the rich people. Yeah, but public input will be a huge part of that, yes, yeah, for sure. Well, the yeah. only thing I can see is if you're if you're going to go to eight cars, mm -hmm. these underground stations are going to be really very large. I mean, yeah. you're talking about it could be two they could be two thousand foot long. Yeah, yeah. Well, even though and these things are going to be how deep? At least a hundred and hundred to hundred twenty foot deep. True, true. That is a good point. Yeah. So the length the, of the stations, the length of the turn back, at the, and the all line. of that will have to be. All of that will have to be cut, cover excavated with decking. So mm -hmm. there could be a tremendous amount of utility relocations. And right. All of that will just be a little more complex than we've ever seen it before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the impact from station construction is one of the things VTA looked at when they were looking at single versus twin. So again, something that, that might be helpful to go with a, a single. And if, if, if one of the biggest impacts from a bigger station is that you know the, the mm -hmm. top down construction. The only, the only other thing that you need to look at going single versus twin is when you go with a twin, there's a possible escape route for fire. Mm -hmm. Or when you go with a single, Would there be a second you don't have track? that escape route. Would there be tracks crossing for safety to get out underneath the ground? Um, I mean, Laura, correct me, but usually there's a, a dividing wall between the two the two tracks inside the uh, the tunnel, the single tunnel. So you'd be able to move from one track area to the other with the cross passage. So or door. So um, and then you know, depending on the depth of the station, you can still have exiting hatches or exiting from the from the tunnel on either side. I know a lot of people here are familiar with other metro studies, but for those who aren't, uh, could you just give a brief overview of what is likely to come out of the feasibility study and enter into the environmental study? Not in terms of which options, obviously, yeah. you're right. looking at them without prejudice, but right. rather like how much of what you're looking at right now is likely to be narrowed down. Right. So. Um, 
what we what we like to do with any of these pre-environmental studies is make sure that it's as comprehensive as we can make it, that we're very inclusive in terms of the public outreach, so that we can rely upon the study when we move into the, the state and federal environmental clearance process. Um, the main intent of this phase of our development process is to, to really start with putting everything on the table, right? We throw all the options out there, take off anything that doesn't have legs, and, and move forward that those options that have merit. So the, the objective at the end of the study is to have narrowed down to a limited set of options. Now what will likely happen is that at the end of the study there may be, let's say, four options that are still feasible, right? But there needs to be possibly a recommendation made by staff as to which of the four are recommended to be advanced into the environmental process. So that's, that's, that's part of our separate action to the board, Metro Board, where we take a recommendation of the Metro Board and we say, okay, here's the, the report, these are the findings, and based on that, we are making a recommendation to advance X, Y, or Z to uh, the environmental process. And then the expectation is that we would begin either a combined uh, state and federal environmental document uh, process or potentially uh, a sequential process where we do this, the CEQA environmental, state environmental first and then followed by the federal. Hey Corey, thank you for the input. Um, I'm, I'm reminded that I was at the uh, recent uh, uh, outreach event on the P3 with Joshua Shank. Uh -huh. he, he added sort of a discussion about you know, potential PDA mm -hmm. uh, with a developer somewhere in the either planning or environmental process in order to elicit industry response or industry uh, interest into this process. And that would have a whole other sort of characteristic. How do you how do you see that process or when does that process sort of look to begin or what's your mm -hmm. thought on that? How does that integrate, interleave with the planning process? Wait, what is PDA? It's a uh uh, preliminary right. development agreement. So it's uh, essentially it's where you're bringing in a uh, private sector partner that will help you during the early development phase of a project. So in this case, potentially pre-environmental. Um, right now we're looking at that as being separate uh, uh, processes. So we have our feasibility study, which is underway, will continue to go underway. And we're looking to keep it to 20 months and finish in next fall. In parallel, we are looking at the P3, as I mentioned before, through the uh, Office of Innovation, and they will advance through that office the, the PDA process uh, for the, the private uh, sector. Um, so I can't tell you right now when the two will um, come together. Um, together soon. Yeah. So, <laughs> but but you know, it's just a matter of whether they come together during this feasibility study, the pre-environmental, or whether or not it's happening um, during the environmental, right? Um, and obviously at the beginning of environmental we have scoping, so if there is a new alternative idea that needs to come out, that would be the time to, to do it. Um, so yeah, they're going to be separate processes for at least for a while, and then once uh, they are on board, we'll bring them together wherever we are within the traditional metro process, um, either planning or environmental. What I do want to just mention before um, I forget, just to follow on a little bit more on our, our decision process is that after we start the environmental, we get to the draft the draft document, whether it's a combined CEQA NEPA document or CEQA document, we come to that draft document phase, um, we at that point select a locally preferred alternative. And so that's when we take the two or three that we might have started the environmental with and we select one that we want to carry into the final. Um, so that's just another milestone in the process that just to, just to make everyone clear on. And that's actually the process that just happened on the East San Fernando Valley project that, that Clara mentioned earlier. So that happened today. The board, Metro Board, approved the LPA that was recommended for that for that corridor. So, sorry. Is it really feasible to get this done by 2020? <laughs> I mean, let's, let's look at that. Have we, have we ever done anything like that in the valley before? I mean, is it, is it had, even? I don't know if I'd love to to the valley in Los, uh, in Los Angeles. Angeles. In Los Angeles. <laughs> the county, the, the state. Yeah, yeah. I, don't <laughs> ever, I don't ever remember a project being done that quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, looking at where we are today. Yeah, yeah. Westside, you know, um, 
you know, East San Fernando, uh, West Santa Ana, those are all very far ahead of where we are right now. They are. They are. I mean, it's true. I mean, it's, it's a, it, like I said, it's a big lift to get this done in, in 10 years, you know. But, uh, and, this, and this job to build it, I, we would have to build this in two or three years. <laughs> We could hardly get we could hardly get the systems integration done in a year. Right. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but we're keeping all the all the options open. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I know uh, SB uh, 827 has had some impact about density around stations. Are you looking at any of that here? Not, not yet. Any opposition? If you are? We're, we're not looking at it yet, but we will. I mean, we have a, a policy at Metro called uh, transit-oriented communities, and it's looking at how we want to be proactive in planning the area around stations. Is there land uh, available? I think the VA well, is supposed to be the VA? The VA well, that, that's a federal property that um, you know has a master plan associated with it. So the VA is looking at developing their entire campus. Transit around that too, possibly? Well, possibly, yeah. I think that's working with them based on the station that we have planned there already. How do you how do you develop in a way that supports that station and they work together? So a similar process could go on at the other stations we're looking at in the valley or in other places. But it's a, it's. it's it's definitely a, a, in coordination with the city, the jurisdiction, or you know, in this case, the federal government, if it's the VA. But it's we don't have as Metro, we don't have land use authority, so we can't we can't conversations can conversations can go on. Yeah. You don't have any ability to promote uh, transit oriented development. We can definitely promote it. <laughs> yeah, we can. Definitely <laughs> promote it. We can, we can uh, you know recommend. I know you have to do in conjunction with the cities. We do. I know, obviously, that if you bring in a P3, that, that could spark that right. discussion even further. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's the whole, it's the whole intent of our transit oriented communities program is to really work with the cities to focus, even at this early stage, you know, if you, they need to change their zoning to, yeah. to better support a future station, and start thinking about it now because none of this happens overnight. How much experience does Metro have with P3? And on that note, how are you going to prepare yourself to deal with this project potentially going P3? Is you know, it's a lot of different components to it, especially doing a large diameter single board for the first time. There's just like a lot of different things that are going to be new to Metro. So how are you right. preparing yourself to tackle that? That's a good question. <laughs> well, we started by uh, developing an office for extraordinary innovation. And uh, they, uh, that's, a, that's a big title that they, uh, they have to carry, but uh, their job is really to, to do a lot of the, the groundwork in terms of understanding how P3s might work for transit. You know, I mean, if they've been really successful, we'll, we'll do LEX aside, but largely in roads and, you know, bridges and things like that, and we're looking at how that might work in, in terms of transit. Um, you know, we, we've... We are relying on them to do a lot of kind of the, like I said, the groundwork to understand it. Um, we may be, this is new to Metro, to be fair. This is all new to Metro in terms of the P3 world. Um, uh, single board would be also new to Metro. So there's some new things that require us to learn and, and, and where we can reach out to colleagues at other places like BTA who may be going through similar things. We've collaborated quite a bit with the airport you know, as they move their, their process because that project is connecting to a metro project. So we were able to learn a lot from what they went through. Uh, it's a different P3 model than what we're looking at for Paul, but, but still I think a lot can be gained from, from that collaboration. So, but we have, we have definitely plenty to learn and plenty to, you know, work out as we go forward. This seems like a typical one to start with. Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't start with an easy one, right? right. Yeah, but well, we have one that's out now of micro transit, um, <laughs> which is yeah, it's almost the other end of the spectrum. When we talk about the micro transit right. project versus <laughs> versus this one. So you're right. This is a big one to jump in the water with and figure out how we how we swim. So, yeah, there, there's a lot more risks involved in this job than there is in micro. Totally, totally yeah. different yeah. spectrum. Totally different. So are they preparing then the, the Westwood station to be double wide? You're gonna have another you're gonna have the Sapal Pass train come in. Um 
Are they going to build yet. it? Or are they going to build it and go, oh, wait, we want to bring it's another a, line? It's an over under situation. Yeah. So the Westwood station on Purple Line is east west, and we're talking about going north south. Right, well, when they're building that station, are they preparing that they're going to have something below? Um, are they going to figure that well, out? Well, they've we thought that about it. <laughs> What's actually in the documents is they didn't pre build the box, but it was discussed during the design of that that there was the potential that a second station would be underneath. So, but, but they didn't go as far as designing like the future box no. and, and building that a portion of it directly underneath. Mm -hmm. yeah. They, they, they're, 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 they're supposed to excavate under. <laughs> we're supposed to include what we call knockout panels as part of this the purple line design, which would be an ability to possibly connect in a corridor from the Sepulveda project right. into, so they're into that station. That. So they're, yeah, that, they're planning that. Right. that. That would give us some flexibility in terms of like government entering government that station government. from another <laughs> station. So and again, that project isn't even started with. Construction yet, so right. there's, there's still opportunities. There's still opportunity to make changes. We, again, yeah. where we get in this study, where decisions that are made, you know, if we come to a better determination of what we want to do here, will inform what accommodations or changes we might want to do on other projects to allow for these this type of thing. So, uh, on the topic of the phase three uh, West Side subway extension in the Wilshire Boulevard, uh, today at the Metro Board, I noticed that there was. A, uh, an item to move the construction staging area for the Westwood VA station um, several hundred feet to the west. And I was wondering, uh, could that potentially enable uh, a portal uh, to be extended toward Federal Avenue that would provide uh, access to run? And the reason why I'm bringing this up is many of the riders who may be taking this future school to pass line may be going to Brentwood or Points West. So uh, is that something that Metro is looking at, given that until now they were looking at building the portals all over the VA parking lot? Um, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know know that we are looking at a second portal <laughs> as part of that station on the VA property. I know we've historically been somewhat constrained with our ability to develop out that port, original portal in the first place. Um, so it's, it, and I'm not familiar enough with the project to know if by extending it to the west, is, <laughs> this is we are proposing, whether that gets us close enough to federal to, to, to make, uh, you know, a portal possible. Um, we do have a lot of, you know, the, the tail tracks and the turnarounds for the line are beyond the station, so that's somewhat constraining in terms of, you know, going beyond it. But I mean, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, there is obviously the market to the west, and uh, that's something that I think we've been looking at in terms of the challenge of how people are coming from the west and getting to the, the single portal that is currently planned as part of that station because, you know, that. The circulation within the VA property is, is, is challenging today, and it would only be more so in the future when you have all these people trying to come to an end of the line station um, and working out whether or not we would even have any parking available for them there because that's, again, the VA's property and, and their choice as to what they do with it. So, those are, it's a great question, but I unfortunately I, don't, I can't tell you today if we've uh, looked into the, the possibility of that four way. Well, I want to thank you for educating everybody. I have a few things to say before everybody gets up and leaves, but uh, let's give Corey a big hand. Thank you. Now, this particular meeting is sort of a topic in 12 months. We'll probably come back and see where we're at in 12 months, just because you know, it's interesting we have the opportunity, we have the between the project managers and everybody to actually document what we do and have people ask questions. And you know, it was really important to be able to ask those questions tonight and to learn because it helps him focus on what's going to go on later and what potential is going to happen, like with the uh, BYD and its monorail proposal. So there's a lot of interesting things. So I also want to thank you all for coming to our meeting tonight. We have another series of meetings scheduled. In the, in the loop is uh, Brian Taylor, 
not Brian Taylor, it's Brian, he's the head of uh, California High Speed Rail. We're working on Brian Kelly. Kelly, right, Brian Kelly. I'm sorry, I'm thinking of UCLA, Brian Taylor. But um, so Brian Kelly, we're having discussions about, it was the last time we had Jeff, Jeff came, the room sold out, and we couldn't put the, the food tables down just because we had like 88 people in here, mm -hmm. which is amazing. But we have him in queue, um, Phil Washington, we've got the San Fernando Valley, the Silmar project, we've got the West Santa Ana branch, there's a lot of different projects to be talking about. And I would have to say one thing, because Farmars was involved in this, we did on this particular project have a meeting with uh, Keys Motors Group in Van Nuys. Keys, um, and I think you back up or you'll say something, but Keys, the government affairs personnel, had real trouble grasping that we would want light rail on Van Nuys Boulevard. It was the last thing the Valley would want, well, it wasn't true. Um, but we talked to the general manager and the government affairs director they were kind of stuck in two eras back. But and also the re is the reason why the rail line only goes up to uh, Oxnard Street and not south of there, because the Keys Motor Group is the largest taxpayer in Los Angeles County, and they call some shots. I call my shots since I send the money every month to talk to, uh, to, talk to some of the people. And it, you know, I'm a customer, and the corporation wants, especially the Toyota Motor Corporation wants employees to use transit, bicycles, walking, transit to get to work, and the message is, you know, it can't be business as always. It's a certain percent of, percent of people need to be able to take transit. We've been building our county. So we have meetings coming up. I will mention for some of the people here, Transit Coalition is a nonprofit and we're supported by sponsors. So um, as you see in those little ads that we send when we send out the meeting announcements, we want the HDRs and the WSPs and the other corporations, center and everybody else to help support our nonprofit and our internship program by buying ads and sponsorships. So, you know, if you go back to the office and talk, we'd be grateful for that consideration. Anyway, so I wanted to thank you. If anybody has any questions, you're free to hang around when we clean up. But, um, you know, if you I hope everybody got their questions answered with Corey. And if not, you know, he's available somehow. And I'd like to also say something because Bart is far too modest in describing his own role. So I, I came into this as a Valley resident, having seen Measure R allocate a billion dollars for the Sepulveda Pass, and then see Metro considering buses for toll lanes on four or five as good solution. Well, ultimately, that may come about in the form of express lines, but you know, seeing that the possibility of a uh, robust mass transit option connecting the valley to the west side wasn't really considered, that, that's what drove me to get involved with the transit coalition. But I could have had the best idea in the world, and I don't think we're without more. Bart Reed was the one who came up with the strategy every step of the way to get the right stakeholders to understand what the concept was, why it would benefit them, and to help build public support so that not only did we have a dozen neighborhood councils, we had the Valley Industry and Commerce Association behind it, we had the Sierra Club behind it, we got both of the candidates for mayor in 2013 behind it. So we, we had a lot of momentum to get this as maybe the, the star project for Measure M when it went on the ballot in 2016. And for anyone who is interested in transit projects generally, there, there, there are a few people in Los Angeles who really understand both the uh, intricate details of you know, how to uh, schedule trains to the big picture of how does it all fit together the way BART does. So 
it's not just a matter of supporting you know, the internship program and supporting these talks. It's also about making sure that we have projects like this, because we wouldn't have it if it weren't for Board School. And I will mention I'm available for consulting. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I have a business card. I'm fine with all of them. Thank you very much for the nice words, Farm Mars. Anyways, thank you everybody thank for you. coming. Thank you. We'll hopefully see you in three weeks. Anybody driving on the west side?